Okay, well, we seem to, uh, most people seem to have joined us. We've got some illustrious names in the attendees list, I can see already. So, uh, Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Stuart, and um, welcome to um, everyone this evening, uh, both to Liverman and particularly to our guests, to what is a new initiative for the Worship Company of Butchers to engage with more industry issues. Um, it really is encouraging to have the support and interest of so many of you. Our future plans include having a lunch bite session interview with a prominent industry personality and a city meet lecture later in the year, but more about that in due course. Um, you don't want to listen to me harp on tonight, so it is my pleasure and my, my, my great thanks to introduce our chairman for this evening, Stuart Roberts, Deputy President, President of the NFU, to take over. Stuart, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Master, and it's a real pleasure to be uh, chairing this evening's event. It's, it's a genuine pleasure to be chairing rather than answering questions this evening, uh, particularly on, on such an important topic. And, and I, I take my hat off to uh, the Worshipful Company for stepping into this arena and putting on uh, this initiative. I'm sure uh, we would all much rather be sat in Butcher's Hall itself uh, maybe with some refreshments uh, this evening, but uh, but we can't in the current circumstances. Uh, but I think this is a great uh, way of engaging, not just within the company, as Andrew says, uh, but across the industry. And 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 I, I did say earlier, we've got a, a phenomenal cast list in the attendees. Uh, and can I please encourage all of you to submit questions? We've had many questions submitted in advance, uh, but please use the Q&A function uh, to submit your question. We've got a great panel uh, with us this evening uh, and I hope we're going to be uh, challenging of each other. I think it's one of the things, particularly when this topic is picked up, uh, that is really important going forward. Now, I remember a number of years ago now, I spoke to the meat industry about a quote from, uh, from a previous uh, chief scientific advisor to the government who at the time had said meat eating needs to become as socially unacceptable as smoking. You can't deny over the last few years, the meat industry has come under phenomenal challenge, uh, whether that be from environmentalists, whether that be from nutritionists, whether that be from uh, other NGOs or single issue groups. But also we know the meat industry and the livestock industry is one of the most progressive in the world. We've got something in this country that we should be rightly proud of. And I hope this evening, we're really gonna get under the skin of what the future of UK meat consumption could be and what will be the challenges. And I hope through the questions, through the speakers, what will be the opportunities for the UK livestock and meat industry going forward? So like Andrew, you've not uh, come to listen to me. Uh, I've just got the pleasure of introducing our three speakers. And this evening we've got uh, Michael Lee, Deputy Vice Chancellor at Harper Adams University and someone who is a real authority on sustainability, on livestock production and particularly ruminant production. Someone I've had the pleasure of speaking alongside on many occasions. We have Steve Evans, Senior Consumer Insights Manager at AHDB our levy body and some of the data they've got is absolutely invaluable. What we need to do is learn what the consumer actually thinks, not what uh, some noises may be. And I know Steve's gonna give us some really good data about what's happening, what consumers think and some of their insights. But I'm delighted our first speaker this evening is Judith Batchelor. Judith will be known to many, many of us. Judith is Sainsbury's Director of Corporate Responsibility, Sustainability and Public Affairs. And it's always fantastic to have Judith's knowledge and insights in this area. Um, I've spoken to her about meat and meat consumption and retail for, I dread to think, probably well over a decade now, Judith, since we first started talking about this. And it's always fantastic to have you on these sorts of panels. We really are uh, honoured you could find an hour to join us this evening. So Judith, over to you for what are the retail insights in terms of uh, the question before us in terms of red meat consumption and future challenges for the industry? Well, 
first of all, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Stuart, for inviting me along this evening. Um, Carla is going to help me with uh, my slides because we had a slight technical hitch earlier, so I'm on a, a different uh, laptop. But I wanted to talk to you this evening about basically the future of UK meat consumption and the role that, that meat consumption has to play in a healthy and sustainable diet. And I think it goes without saying that um, I believe that red meat does have a role to play in a healthy and sustainable diet, but perhaps not in the way that we have imagined it in the past. Um, so on the next slide, what I've tried to do is set out some of the challenges for the red meat sector as I see it from a retailer and customer point of view. And the first point to make is the science is complex emerging and it makes communications a real challenge. The second thing is that actually there are lots of data points set here and Stuart touched on that. And, and data that links to animal welfare, climate and environmental impacts. But most of that information is presented inconsistently and is not always as accurate as it could be. The metrics that we're using, which I will touch on later, um, to measure the nutrient quality versus the greenhouse gases that might be emitted from particular foods is not well understood. And if you combine all of that with the fact that actually a lot of the growth in plant based foods is around actually ultra processed foods and that's causing lots of noise. But fundamentally, the question isn't whether things are processed or unprocessed. The question is, are they healthy or aren't they healthy? And again, there is no definition of what a healthy food is or um, what that constitutes to a healthy diet. And then. I suppose there's a lot of communication out there that, that is deliberately disingenuous and, and either because the people who are making those communications are not necessarily well informed or they are oversimplifying some of these complexities to the point that they become simplistic messages. And of course, there could be a fantastic regulated labeling scheme, much as we have with nutrition, um, but that's a, a long way off and there are lots of challenges with that. However, as always, I, I have reasons to be optimistic. Um, and on the next slide, I think what I, I try to show is that fundamentally customers know um, that they need to make more sustainable choices. They want to make more sustainable choices but they don't know how, and they certainly don't know that the biggest impact that they can have is through the food choices they make. Um, and that was talked about um, quite clearly with WWF and what they called the power on your plate. But all customers are different. So the next slide, please, Carla. Um, and what I'm trying to show here is um, there's a lot of work been done on what drives customers' choices and, and what they what they have on their plate. And nutrition is just one thing. And, and if life was simple, it would be the only thing. But there's all sorts of things in there like taste, quality, provenance, um, things like culture. And, and the, the, the a chart on the right there basically looks at different diets and what those different diets deliver in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So you think about the diversity of the UK and the kind of diets and the kind of foods and the kind of food choices that people can make is a massive spread in terms of what people are eating for a, a equally massive number of different reasons. And again, we need to be cognizant of that. But moving on, if, if you get to the point where um, it's really good news is that our own national dietary guidelines from the government, the Eat Well Guide, um, are good news. Good news for personal health, but also good news for planetary health in the main. And that says eating a little less red meat, eating a little less dairy, eating a lot more fruit and veg, eating a lot more complex carbohydrates could actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a third, improve land use, water use, and actually increase um, years of healthy living, which is the the chart on the right, which is the disability adjusted life years, which is 
long healthy lives as, a, as opposed to long not quite so healthy lives. So moving on, if, if it's good for the ecosystem, um, then one thing we need to be really watchful of um, is if what's good for the ecosystem is also good for our own health. And I share this because it's a piece of work that's been looked at um, people choosing unhealthy plant-based diets, which I know this has been topical in the news when there's been a lot of talk about ultra processed foods, but, it, but you can be equally unhealthy eating a plant-based diet and overeating and not eating the right things as you can be on an animal-based diet. And again, it would be good to, to remind people of that, particularly if you see where the growth area in some of these plant-based foods are. So on the next slide, what I've um, basically said is um, it, there are a huge number of different protein sources. They all have different impacts. And I would take a lot of this data with a pinch of salt because a, a lot of these data sources are using different methodologies for calculating greenhouse gas emissions. But the point being is if you look at um, complete protein and what how much protein you get per 100 grams it looks looks pretty good if you look at other aspects of the food not just the protein that you're getting but all of the other micronutrients it's a very different story so next one please um this for me is is the the ultimate so the way that we are um talking about red meat and talking about greenhouse gas emissions at the moment is per 100 grams of food but of course we don't eat food in 100 grams we eat food in calories and nutrients um so the next uh, build on the slide um, if you click on shows what that means in terms of greenhouse gases per 100 calories and there the discrepancies start to get less if you look at the next one which is the final build this is basically looking at the nutrient density of the top six nutrients per hundred calories um, and by food group. And if you start to look at the total nutrient density, not just the protein, and you look at it in the hundred calories consumed, then red meat looks very different. So um, I would describe that as making every calorie count every calorie count in terms of nutrient density, every calorie count in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. And when you start to really look at it at that granular level, then a really interesting communication challenge comes up. So that was all I wanted to say. Um, we've got to help customers do the right thing. They want to do it. And it is a big communication challenge. So thank you. Thank you, um, Judith. And look, I, I, two of the areas I know we will return to uh, in questions are data, which is very close to your own heart. Uh, but also, I was really hoping that nutrient density will come up. And it's great that you've you've put that marker in the sand. So thank you. Um, I now want to move on to, to Steve Evans, who I said is Consumer Insight Manager at AHDB. Um, and look, I'm a livestock producer. That's what I do. And one of the things that, that sometimes we don't spend enough time doing is looking at what is the consumer saying? What is the consumer doing? What are the insights behind the consumer, not some of the noise that often surrounds some of this? Um, so, Steve, really looking forward to it. I've had uh, previews of this presentation on previous occasions or bits of it. So I know it's really good. Um, and Steve, straight over to you. Thanks, Stuart, um, and thanks, Andrew, for inviting me. So no pressure there, but I'm going to attempt the first uh, hurdle, which is sharing my screen. So just uh, bear with me while I do that. And maybe you can let me know if um, anyone has a problem seeing this. Um, so uh, I'm Steve Evans. I'm the Senior Consumer Insight Manager at AHDB. Um, and as a team, we uh, are the retail and consumer insight team. There's six of us in the team. We actively look at retail and consumer shopping behavior in the marketplace. So we do this across a lot of uh, AHDB's uh, sector products, but in particular on, on meat. And some of the slides I've got here are, are almost across our, our wealth of data, really, from consumer attitudinal surveys, but also Kantar uh, purchase behavior. So 
Um, what I'm looking to highlight to you today is some of the challenges that we face from consumer behaviours in the home, but also in the backdrop there um, about the impact that it's had on meat consumption. So I think uh, you probably wouldn't sit in a, a webinar or a, an update that hasn't said it's unprecedented time, lots of things have changed, um, and this has probably been a year where we have seen the most um, changes in terms of consumer behaviours that we, we've obviously experienced in everyone's lifetime. Um, looking at the current position, where we are at the moment is obviously uh, we've had lots of restrictions in place. Those are starting to ease, but we're going through a period of economic uncertainty, the, the kind of COVID ripple effect as we see the impact on food service and, and consumer confidence and the economy as a whole. We've seen significant rises in the in-home meals that are eaten, but we've also seen changes in the dynamics of what people eat in the home. We've all spent a lot more time probably in our homes than we uh, have ever, ever done in the last year. And that's also had an impact uh, on food consumption. But the kind of key things I wanted to touch upon today are some of the industry reputational things that are imp impacting meat consumption, but also those con consumer drivers um, of behavior. So some of those uh, include health, environment, and the sentiment around buying British and local. So I'm gonna start off with the environment, but I will kind of touch upon uh, the uh, other areas as well. AHDB have done lots of research in this area alongside lots of academic papers that obviously exist and Judith took us through um, some excellent research there on um, uh, various different things that impact meat consumption. Uh, our um, consumer research that we published findings for last year looked at consumer trust in the industry and in particular looked at the environmental impact and we found in the backdrop that actually farming and food production sat slightly um, behind some of the other things around air travel and the kind of large industrial factories and industry. Um, but the uh, significant rises that we've seen of consumers talking about the environment aren't to be ignored. And in particular, when we talk to consumers about how they proactively look at uh, talking about tackling the environment, a lot of them kind of like links back to things that are in their direct control. Often it's things like uh, packaging, and plastics, but also there is talk about food labeling and sustainable farming. Um, and then there's obviously wider farming practices that come into kind of reference as well. The other factor that's impacting uh, meat consumption at the moment is around the perceptions around uh, health. And I think Judith touched upon some of these, but that certainly comes through in our consumer tracker that we run through YouGov. So we, we talk to over a thousand consumers every three months and we actually ask them about meat consumption. And the top reason that we have at the moment it, um, for redu reducing meat consumption as a sentiment is health. And then the other factors that come slightly behind that are the environment. If you'd have gone back five, six, 10 years ago, it used to be all about the price. It was a really price sensitive kind of market. People talking about the cost of meat. We are, the agenda's kind of moved a little bit around. It's not to say price isn't important, but it's to say that actually some of the wider things around health um, and the environment are actually of key critical importance. That's why we think there's a great, there's a challenge there, but there's also a great opportunity. And some of the work that we've been doing within AHDB and, and talking to the industry, uh, whether it be with retailers, processors, or, or farmers themselves, are actually about some of the things that we could proactively talk about, but also addressing the kind of the health behavioral changes. So some of that might be referencing around leaner cuts, but also coming out and talking really proactively about the fact of meat as a source of protein, the vitamins and minerals that that can offer. And really, I think some of the points around that consistent voice in the marketplace um, as well, and actually being proactive around actually getting through the health messaging to consumers in quite a crowded marketplace is, is, is really critical. The kind of other thing I wanted to touch upon um, in the last year that we've seen a significant uh, kind of uh, change really is around the sentiment around buying British and Providence. Uh, we have uh, it, it's always been there a little bit, but also sort of slightly uh, removed from the more functional things about the price, the quality, the appearance of the product. We've seen in the last year that there has been a really strong sentiment from consumers about the desire and appetite to buy British. And it's a really positive uh, thing to come through in the last year. And there's almost a great opportunity here to seize that moment. And it's certainly something that we've seen in our ongoing consumer tracker. Uh, in the uh, sort of middle and latter part of last year, we saw peaks in consumer sentiment that actually said about purchasing red meat helps support local farmers. Now, the kind of thing that we're noticing at the moment in our continuous research within HDB is that is starting to ease back. So the, the time is now almost really to, to really uh, to capitalize and to seek the opportunity about customs and um, 
consumers that are actually looking out for British, but also there's a really strong link around trust and telling the story about the product, about how it's being produced. And that really drives through the quality attributes. Um, and I think sort of touching upon that quality attribute, I think for a lot of our listeners on this webinar uh, that may be a direct butcher, uh, is actually when we do consumer surveys, and we can filter this in to those actually shop at butcher shops. This is a survey of 500 um, consumers that talked about that buy at butcher shops. It's good quality is the, the number one reason about why they buy from that product. So I think it's making sure it's an opportunity within retail, but it's also a great opportunity within butchers about talking about how are you communicating this to consumers about talking about the quality of the product. We know that there's big reputational factors that we've got to balance, but we also know that comes in the backdrop of key purchase drivers such as price, enjoyment and taste. So when we look at the market performance of uh, meat as a whole, we see that the latest 12-week uh, figures would have the market, a meat market, meat, fish and poultry at 14%. That's above total grocery inflation. And you can kind of see where we've kind of marked in February 2020 that significant rise in in-home um, meals. We've also seen rises in in-home consumption for beef, lamb and pig meat. And also the, the strong growth here in butcher shops. Uh, in 2020, butcher shops um, have seen a 22% rise in, um, in market volumes that have gone through uh, their, their outlets for, for meat, uh, meat and poultry. Um, and that's a, a higher than uh, total grocery. So there's a great opportunity here to capitalize on the footfall that would have been uh, sort of uh, in the last year that would have been um, coming through the doors. So overall, we think there's some great opportunities around um, uh, sort of capitalizing on some of the, the wider reputational things, but we need to remember that there's key things about value, um, scratch cooking, snacking through convenience meals that's going to creep in as well as, as we look at consumer behaviors in the home. And there's probably some key triggers around versatility, taste, quick and enjoyment and the ability to personalize meals that offer that great platform to talk to consumers. We kind of think there's a great opportunity around providing that inspiration. We think there's a great uh, opportunity around communicating the sustainability efforts and, and also reassuring around health but also capitalizing on that great trust that's coming through for British farmers, that interest in British products. And we've seen this roll out in in-store environments. There's quite a lot of uh, sort of in-store sort of thing that looks about inspiring consumers uh, and educating them as well. And it's important to inspire alongside as educate. So consumers don't want to get told everything. They want to actually discover and, and, and find this in inspiration for their, themselves. So the in-store fixture and the environment that you host for consumers is really critical. But that's also uh, some of the key functional things around uh, the appearance of the product, the actual meals that it's going to be featured in are really important, but it's also that wider reputational backdrop that's also really critical. Uh, I appreciate there's time for kind of questions and, and debate as we that we go on about the future and opportunities, but there's also lots of wealth of insight on the HGB website that I've not covered uh, in this eight minute update. So. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'll hand back to Stuart and uh, have to take any kind of questions or discussions following this presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. And we've already had a couple of questions in, uh, certainly triggered by some of what you said uh, and maybe some of, of what role AHDB can play going forward in answering some of those. So, so certainly we will be, uh, we'll be coming back to that. Our final um, speaker, and can I thank everyone so far for sticking to time? So no pressure, Michael, okay? You, you need to do the same. Um, it is a, a real pleasure to have Michael Lee with us. As I said earlier, he's Deputy Vice Chancellor these days at Harper Adams University, a real authority um, in this area, and certainly someone who, uh, from an NFU perspective, has been enormously helpful over the last few years uh, in talking about production systems, sustainability of red meat, etc. And certainly our own uh, documents and publications on this have got a lot of Michael's fingerprints on them. So we are very lucky to have you with us, Michael. And uh, over to you. Thank you, Stuart. And you know how good I am at sticking to time. So yeah, good luck with that one. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Can you see that, Stuart? Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, a big thank you to um, WCB for the invitation. Um, and let, let's be blunt, um, as a species, we have been awful to this planet. And if we are any other species on the planet, we'll be considering a cull. 
we've had a huge impact on a whole array of natural capital and natural services. And I think this is best summarized by Rockstrom's papers in science in 2009 and updated in 2014, which refers to the planetary boundaries which anthropogenic impact has exceeded. You know, the, the planet as any biological system has some natural homeostatic capability to bounce back, but human intervention on this planet has exceeded that plasticity, that elastic band's ability to bounce back. It's been pulled too far and the planet has been um, damaged so that it can no longer return. So why is this focus driven by agriculture uh, when agricultural emissions are around 10 to 14 percent if we think about climate change? Well, I think the, a key focus is, is, is driven by this metric, carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, and this is really driven by the, um, a, an indicator for, for, for global warming. And although agriculture is only around 10 to 12% globally, livestock contributes about 70% of this. And ruminants have seen to be a key driver for this as this indicator has been shown. And this, this, this metric has been driven by the scientific community as a key driver to address uh, global warming. And a key focus, as you say, has been on red meat and particularly ruminant sector. So the, these red bars here are protein produ production. And you can see here a concentration of ruminant livestock. And one thing as a scientist you'll notice though, firstly, is this high er um, error bar. So meaning there's a high layer level of variance associated with this. But I've got to be uh, clear, you know, as a scientist, we've used these, this data to publish high impact publications in nature and science. But what use is this data to the, to the, to the farming community and the agricultural community? Well, it, it, it's meaningless because the danger of global averages really tells us nothing about the local level that we need to improve. And it also tells us nothing about the uh, trajectories and patterns which are occurring nationally. So here, if we break away from that data which is published in, in nature or, or, or science, and we look at the patterns in terms of consumption of, of protein, particularly livestock protein within the UK, we can see red meat consumption has been dropping since the 1950s, and that's been replaced by chicken. And if we compare that, the, the average data here around 60 kilograms, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of product, and we look at the average levels of emissions associated with UK systems, you can see that we're significantly lower than the global average. But that doesn't say that we haven't got room for improvement. Of course we can, but we also need to balance up the metrics. So why don't I like this um, metric of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product? Well, I actually don't like this metric on both sides of the ratio. First of all, carbon dioxide equivalents. We're very much aware now, or at least we should be, about uh, GWP 100 against GWP star and, and the way that we need to disaggregate, disaggregate different greenhouse gases. You know, that's what we've done in, sorry, let me just go back. That's what we've done here is to have a look at the levels of methane and nitrous oxide which are associated with different livestock productions. So we can look at improvement and interventions at a level that will help the farming community improve on those systems. And we know that the greenhouse gases behave in very different ways. And I'm sure there'll be questions on GW star moving forward. But at the moment we are tied into using GWP 100. So that means we need to reflect methane and reduce methane across our our, our farming systems and our production systems. And the UK industry and the NFU with its 2040 pledge is driving on that. And I'm sure we can achieve net zero moving forward. And we all need to reduce methane, whether we use GWP uh, 100 or GWP star. So I can deal with that part of the ratio. 
What about the other part of the ratio, kilograms of product? Well, Judith has already reflected on this and I was delighted to see her presentation. And, and what I've done here is something very similar. You know, four or five years ago, we were one of the first groups to say, why are we looking at food items by weight? Why aren't we looking them at, at, at them in terms of the nutrients they, they, they contain? So whilst Judith's uh, example used the NDS6, what we've done here is look at the key nutrients that livestock or protein will contain as to why it's part of the Eat Well Guide. So if you consider the Eat Well Guide and you consider the nutrients contained within it, why is and why do human nutritionists say we need a certain amount of livestock protein? Well, it's driven by these key nutrients here. What we've done in this slide is look at the RDI, the recommended daily intake of those key nutrients, and then the amount of different livestock products that 100 grams of that uh, meat will provide. And then we've produced a new um, a metric of sustainability associated with global warming potential, which equates carbon dioxide equivalents per 1% of the recommended daily intake of these key nutrients as why protein is on an eat well guide. And when you do that, the natural ranking associated with livestock products is reversed. And you see that beef actually, whereas opposed to chicken in the previous metric, has the lower uh, carbon footprint per unit of RDI associated with protein. So we need to rebalance the metric. And I'm delighted to say there's been some recent publications associated with hammering home this message. So first of all, my, my old group at Rothamsted Research, which has shown that we need to concentrate on the nutrient content when we are relating to uh, protein sources or any feed group. And here, 100 grams of beef delivers 18.6% of all ID RDI of key nutrients. And then another paper from Paul Monaghan um, from Massey University actually said, well, we also need to correct um, protein for digestibility. Uh, and Judith related to that and used DS. So I just wanted to pull out one of the really exciting slides from Paul's paper, which actually looks at the carbon dioxide equivalents per 100 grams of total protein which Paul and Nemechek used, and which is becoming the standard text and, uh, and is what the Eat Lancet is constantly using, and actually corrected that for digestible protein. So in this example, he used digestible lysine. And you can see there's a change in the rankings in terms of these protein sources, but also, markedly, a reduction in the impact variance from a difference from 50 down to six in terms of the importance of that protein source. But additional to that, my group has really been looking at the fact that of course we don't just eat single food commodities, we eat diets and we don't, we're not carnivores, but we don't just eat meat, we need to eat more fresh fruit and vegetables and we also have a proportion of the plate which is energy. So when we're looking at the impact of our protein, be it plant-based, be it myco, be it livestock-based, we need to consider its nutrient density in combination, combination with the other parts of that plate. So what we started to do is to say, well, let's have a look at different proteins and combination of different food groups that we consume those proteins with. So this analysis here, we considered three main protein sources, beef, pork, or tofu. So tofu being our pl main plant-based um, um, protein. And then we considered that protein with a combination of carrots, tomatoes, or cucumbers, always with apples. So we've got to have our fruit in there uh, and pot potatoes, bread, or rice. So we made multiple diets associated with those different plates. And then we looked at the nutrient density score deriving from that protein. So remember, remember going back to the key nutrients that proteins contain as to why they are in the Eat Well Guide. And we have two ways of reflecting that. So we used NDS 15, not NDS 6. Uh, we looked at an uncapped score and a capped score. So let me just explain that first. So uncapped means as you, uh, if the protein contains 
120% your requirements for vitamin B12, then you included 120 in that score. But in the capped score, as soon as the plate admits your requirements, you didn't get any other advantage from it. So it was capped, okay? So you can see that under red, you have a higher nutrient density score because it's uncapped. It keeps on growing. But in terms of the, the cap score, you'll see it's lower. But look at the difference and the difference in driving between the livestock proteins and the plant-based proteins. And the way this cap score has affected the plant-based proteins more is that, of course, tofu is more akin to the plants that are on the plate, whereas the livestock protein is more different to the plants that are on the, pro uh, on the plate. So it contains a different profile of key nutrients. And therefore, the additive benefit of having that protein on the plate is over and above that of a plant-based uh, addition. If you then reflect the nutrient density score associated with those key nutrients, again, the beef is still higher than, than pork and still higher than tofu. But look what happens when you look at the, 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 the size of that difference. So when you look at it at a weight level, beef is 15.4 times the carbon dioxide or the, um, or the greenhouse gas potential of tofu. When you correct for nutrient density, it drops to 2.2. And the next level is to have a look at the bioavailability of those key nutrients. And that is in development now. And I believe, and I think our early indicators that pork will probably be less than tofu and beef won't be far off. But even if it wasn't different, of course, we have to recognize that sustainability is not just carbon. And there are other metrics we need to consider. And as Judith and Steve have already said, we need a lot more fruit and vegetables on our plate and a little bit less protein. So if we consider the importance of arable land use, we've got to think about the role of livestock of delivering high quality of nutrition with lower arable land use. Let's use that arable land for producing fantastic plants for human nutrition. And let's use our livestock as part of that circular economy and using land not suitable for growing crops. And when you use this metric, it really emphasizes the important role that livestock play in sustainability indicators. Arable land use per unit of RDI. And, and, and it really emphasizes the critical role of our ruminant livestock. It shows that our monogastric friends are still important, but really emphasizes the critical role that, that ruminant livestock play. So my final point, Stuart, because I can see you're getting touchy. We have to remember that we overconsume protein. On average, we need about 60 grams per day. And the question is, and it goes back to do this point about flexitarianism, you know, how much livestock protein should we consume for being sustainable? And if you look at arable land use, it's certainly not zero. And you have this hockey diagram description. And our analysis is showing that around about 25, possibly up to 30 grams of livestock protein is part of that sustainable pathway. If you look at these indicators in terms of greenhouse gas and also in terms of arable land use. Thank you, Stuart. Thank I you. Hope I've done eight minutes. Uh, look, thank you, Michael. You know full well you went over time, but you also know full well that I have such uh, respect for everything you say. I'll always let you go over anyway. So it's a good joy I didn't say that before or we'd still be sat here at eight o'clock listening to you. But thank you, um, Michael. If all our speakers could uh, could come back off uh, uh, off mute, that would be great. Um, and look, we have had a phenomenal number of questions both before uh, and this evening. And I'm going to say it now, we are not going to get through all of those questions. So I'm going to try as best I can to, to theme them uh, and bring a few together. And we've had quite a lot of questions around communication. Um, and one of the things that, that I think frustrates everyone uh, in this arena, and we've just sat through 40 minutes of brilliant presentations, which talk so balanced, so intelligently, uh, and so clearly about the importance of red meat, about how not all systems are the same, 
get under the skin of this point that it's not a simple plant good, meat bad. It's way more complicated than that. But what we also know is there are some very vocal groups out there. We know there are some very well resourced groups out there, possibly for commercial reasons in many cases, who can articulate a very alternative narrative in a very simple, straightforward way. And we also know people make uh, consumer buying decisions in seconds. Coming to you first, Michael, how do we take the information we've learned this evening and turn it into a two-minute YouTube video, turn it into a short series of tweets? How do we get this message across in a uh, digestible way, a powerful way? Uh, because we know we've got the foundations. We know we've got the science. We know we've got the evidence. We've just not been very good at communicating it. Michael, you first. Yeah, I think what we have to do, we have to re-win the health discussion and really position livestock products as part of a healthy, balanced diet and as part of a pathway for a sustainable planet. Whereas we've lost that argument when we have got so much of the answers within our armory. But to, to address that health um, uh, component, we have to be and talk about responsible consumption levels. We, we know we overconsume. We know we overeat processed foods, whether they be plant-based or livestock-based. But it's clear when you have a product with the nutrient density score that red meat and white meat has, that it has a clear component for human health. And when you think about the circularity that livestock can play in a sustainable agricultural system, that it is part of the pathway for a future um, sustainable agricultural system and net zero. So we have the tools. We have lost the argument at the moment because it's, it's health here, livestock over here. Actually, we need to re-emphasize our role in health, both human and planetary. It's a good point. And, and Judith, just building on that as well, and you touched a lot in your presentation and, and you often do about the importance of data. And, and some of this is really complicated. Pam Brooks in the, in the questions raised this point about how do we get complex data across in a simple way that, that your consumers and customers can then understand and, and really then start to action the positives that they need to do off the back of it? Well, I think I think there's two things actually, and I'm a I'm a big fan of labelling, and 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 apologies if I've said this before, but um, if I think about where we got to, have got to on nutrition labelling, that's taken us 25 years to get to um, definitions for fibre, methodologies for testing fibre, and everyone agreeing that they're going to use a common database that's available freely for everyone until we get to the point where we've got good definitions and we've got um, you know freely available information that is of a high quality then labeling is going to be um, like the wild west you know, because everyone will be able to do their own thing so I think the first thing we have to do is create that level playing field in the way that we've done on nutrition labeling the second thing is that we almost need, a, I think, a charter for responsible communication, a bit like, you know, the plain English program, but something where responsible people sign up to, to basically um, trying to get to the, what I would call the best truth. And knowing that the best truth is going to evolve, because as we learn more, I mean, we would never have had this conversation 15 years ago, probably wouldn't have had this conversation 10 years ago. Um, and in five years, we'll be having a slightly different conversation because we will have learned more and moved it on. But this um, relentless pursuit of the best truth, because there is no point us all dashing down the road to restoring our environment and net zero if one man's net zero is different from another man's net zero and one man's biodiversity net gain is another man's um, biodiversity loss I mean it just won't work so I think great standards on on metrics and labeling and everyone signing up to some kind of responsible communications charter but we can do that here ourselves you know as a group there's nothing to stop us all signing up to 
you know, a, a communications charter that has got some nice key messages and that we all are singing off the same hymn sheet. It's, re it's really interesting, actually, Jude, this best truth. I really like that phrase. I, it's a bit different to the alternative truth that is, uh, that is often peddled by other people. And interestingly, actually, the, um, I was talking about a communications charter with the World Farmers Organization and, and the Global Consumer Organization the other day, where actually everyone wants that, that, that best truth. I really like it. Um, Steve, just turning to you, and, and there's been quite a few questions um, in the chat about if you like, the, the, the role of levy boards, the role you should be playing. We obviously had your Eat Balanced campaign um, earlier this year. But a further question that got raised as well, and I think it was Bill Jeremy raised it, was around uh, the, um, the joys of devolution and the fact that actually we don't now just have, if you like, one brand Britain, we have different ones. So what about from a levy point of view and, and your experience around consumer communication, et cetera, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think um, the key thing that I've kind of uh, certainly sort of the, the stuff that we do as a levy organization, we're, we're essentially the evidence collector and trying to make sure that we're actually know our consumers behaviors and also we get the target audience right. So we've heard a lot of complex sort of industry issues here, which I think we, need to be very careful about what is an industry issue and what how do we get that over the line to consumers so how do we how do we get the consumer to understand or appreciate the complex issues and topics that we, we've kind of discussed on the on these kind of sessions and for me it's also about understanding who the right audience for, for is is for that so some of the campaign you you mentioned the balance campaign we we kind of took took a lot of market research to 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 out out there to look at actually targeting those that are considering reducing their meat and dairy consumption, for instance, rather than tackling the a vegan or a a, a meat avoider. So, for the context, the 0.8% of the population are vegan and 80% follow a non-meat avoidance diet. But we know that there are what we kind of call meat waverers a little bit. Those that actually, if you don't reassure, if you don't give them a clear message um, about the benefits of eating the product then you might see them gently ease back and some of that we've written about and trying to report out to the industry about that unconscious reduction that actually subconsciously people are kind of not really gaining as much reassurance and proactiveness about the the health messaging about the environmental footprint and i think for me it's how do we convert that into a retail environment but like you say seconds we're kind of trying to digest really complex decisions that we might be having across the industry but I think to do this point it's about we need to be really clear consistent about letting that land then with consumers so they can see a consistent clear message um because that's really the only way that I think consumers will then absorb absorb that information and, and in turn change behavior thanks um, Michael just coming back to you and there's a there's a great question from Joanna Price in the uh, in the chat which you can read later it's very complimentary about you as 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 lots of comments always are Michael but she makes a, a very interesting point which is about it's one thing in terms of communication with consumers and we've touched a lot of that the the, the last series of questions you all touched on it but we've also got a big potential policy challenge here so actually We've got, particularly with, a, and I need to be careful because it's a, a, a livery company event, so we're not allowed to do politics, but you know, we have a very populist uh, arena for politics, very much following some of those sentiments we've talked about in terms of consumer communications. How do we get more of your information and your thought processes into the, to the policy arena? For example, how do we finally crack dual reporting of GWP 100 and GWP star rather than the current environment we're in at the moment. Yes, uh, thank you. Hi, Joe. Um, I was going to say good to see you, but I can't see you. So but anyway, th thanks for the question. Um, it's yeah, it's it, it, it's it's the biggest challenge that we have as academics is is to ensure that our message and the research is is used. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to say that we, we engage so well with retailers, you know, and we, we are seeing those messages and those indicators come through. You know, you saw it from Judith's presentation when you're looking at sustainability at a nutrients level. I suppose the complexity is how do you convert very, very complex messages over to something that the consumer can understand and the politician can understand 
and also obviously with the politicians you know they they don't like messages that aren't going to be popular uh, and particularly if you're talking about the price of food and the responsibility for environmental pollution and 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 how you would counter that within the system then then that's always going to be dangerous because they, they, they get the alarm bells about losing votes but of course we, we continue those discussions and we need to engage close dialogue and interactions with the NFU close dialogues and interactions with DEFRA and we we slowly break down the, those barriers regarding the indicators of GWP 100 and GWP star that's a real complex discussion and I could go on for about an hour where, where, but 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 I but I won't but we we are starting to break down those barriers we're starting to have these discussions I have now seen carbon toolkits that allow farmers to click on GWP star or GWP 100 so there is this um, methodology improvement it's a really good point and i think we are now actually hearing governments talking to governments and actually mentioning gwp star and gwp 100 which would have been unheard of a while ago other than us and the new zealanders talking to each other which was was always the case so i think it's it's really good to hear um, judith one of the things um that you touched on you touched on this charter i love this idea this can be the the birthplace of your your charter of of best truths but one of the, the discussions you and I have had actually in, in other arenas is in some ways, one of the joys of the industry that we're all in is its fragmented nature. Actually, that's that's what makes it so, so uh, innovative. It's what it makes it so diverse. It's what makes it so interesting. But that's also one of its challenges when it comes to us all working together. You know, what more do we all need to be doing? How can we get over that? fragmentation if you like and, and what would be a step for all of us to take to, to sign up to your your charter there Judy? Well, well I think the first thing is um, you have to every this is a journey isn't it you know a journey of us all learning and acquiring new skills and expertise and new jargon new language and everyone is a different part of that journey so i think there is something that says you know what what's the the common denominator that everyone can buy into and that might be just some acknowledgement that we're all going to use a similar database um of data standards i'm not talking now about carbon modeling tools and things but just you know if this data was to be made available and freely available then everyone would use it at least then when we start to talk we're talking and making comparisons and benchmarks on a level playing field which at the moment doesn't exist i think the other thing is um you know and all of these things what would other people sign up to so what would other people support us in doing so if it was some messages around the importance of red meat in the diet at a certain level and whatever that portion might be and, and what that looked like in comparison to um, plant protein so michael's last slide then how would you get the bnf for the british nutrition foundation to support you how would you get other accepted um experts to corroborate that corroborate that evidence because i think one of the things that we can't do is just talk to ourselves and and we would want other people saying this on behalf as well as us saying it for ourselves but if we could agree that it doesn't need to be a large number of things but just a really good starting point then i think lots of people could buy into that and um, and yes the the other alternative is very complicated and but you know we need to do one step at a time so i think i think there is a possibility of finding something we could all align around and that others could support us in in saying yeah and that, that, those those independent advocates those those unusual voices because look the meat industry would say that wouldn't they you know it's it we, we have a slight vested interest in meat consumption as a as a livestock and meat industry so it's hardly uh, surprising and there were, we, we had had a, a couple of questions about yeah you know, who is that trustworthy source of information you've you've touched on it there and um, steve i just want to come back to you and, and i'm gonna i'm gonna take chair's prerogative i'm gonna slightly overrun uh which i've only ever overrun on a worshipful company event once before when i spoke for six minutes rather than 
five minutes in introducing a speaker at a court lunch and have never been asked to speak again. So I'm sure this is the last event I'll chair, but I'm going to let the event just overrun slightly. We'll go on maybe for another five or 10 minutes. I hope that's OK. We will be finished by, by 10 past. But Steve, I want to come back to you and, and you uh, quite interestingly set out these are the different uh, influences in people's buying choices. Health was right up there, as you say. At the moment, one of the things when it comes to the environment, all we're ever talking about is carbon. It's, you know, it's carbon this, it's carbon that, it's net zero there, that, that we all are, and, it, and it's right. But actually, do you think at times we possibly spend too much time thinking about carbon and not enough time thinking about those other things? I saw actually waste and packaging were, were things that were right at the top of the consumer's agenda. But any thoughts, Steve? Yeah, I think um, you raised an interesting point, Stuart, because I think like from a point of view of what a consumer does, I think there's probably a certain sentiment that they probably bring what can they control what are some of the there's a certain element of degree of control that people might feel that they have over the wider environmental footprint of british agriculture when they're going to buy a single product in sainsbury's that's quite an overwhelming feeling isn't it and you can imagine it that across the meat category then you go on to your next style and i think for me it's kind of like the packaging is probably in the one that is probably you know being obviously kick-started by lots of uh sort of tv exposure and social media content about pack plastic and packaging but it's also the one that the consumers feel like they can directly control and i think sort of like monitoring those trends is is really interesting but it's it, you don't you can't forget about any of the other things and and i think sort of you do have to tackle these complex issues as an industry but you also have to kind of make it digestible for the consumer uh, we we've kind of done you know direct research with consumers and I've kind of watched firsthand consumers literally sort of drop when you sort of like stop top line messaging about environment about meat and the sustainability of British agriculture and meat production and then the more information you give actually they get a little bit either confused or they don't know and then it or it contradicts what they've heard on social media or so and then then they got doubt and I think for me it's kind of like it's really hard in a world where we, we're faced with lots of different sources of information about how you get that credible source so you, you talked about credibility yes you're not you know you might not get it directly from one one person or thing you actually get it from a source of family friends health professionals influencers and I think you can't sort of align with just one it's almost has to touch those multiple points but from a point of a consumer and their consumption, they're going to have these big issues in the backdrop. They want to make good choices, but then it's also it's a it's a it's a big burden for them to carry into the supermarket. So we need to make sure that in store and in fixture, we make it as easy as and smooth to have all these underlying kind of big environmental health things, but sitting along that I want to I want a tasty product. I want to enjoy it. I've got a, I'm going into shop. I want it, I enjoy my food. Don't forget about the taste and the enjoyment and the practicality. They're the they're the kind of cornerstones of consumption. But we also you've got an undercurrent like a sucker punch. You need to make sure you're delivering on these other factors alongside it. And I think we need to make sure we're not one thinking one or the other. It's unfortunately the consumer has multiple needs now, and we've got to hit across multiple uh, uh, touch points now for them to to obviously uh, convert and get it into the shopping basket in the home meals that they can enjoy for uh, you know the future it's, it's it's a really good point steve and it's pretty sad actually that we have to remind ourselves that one of the things we ought to be doing is celebrating the enjoyment of food you know it's it, yeah. it, it's pretty sad we, we all get and we all do it we get technical about it we talk about nutrient density we talk about carbon for actually there's nothing wrong with enjoying a really good british steak uh, and sometimes we just need to remind ourselves about that in, in the right portion size, of course, uh, <laughs> etc. Um, Steve, just following on, so it doesn't follow on at all, actually, I don't just say that. But um, one of the areas we, we haven't touched on tonight and we're not going to because we're just not going to have time is trade. Uh, lots of talk about trade. Michael, you touched about different production systems around the world, how we talk about global averages for them, these figures. But there are lots and lots of other sectors of our industry in other parts of the world facing exactly the same challenge, exactly the same consumer pressures. Steve, do you see more opportunity for us to work with other countries uh, against this backdrop that, that have exactly the same challenges as we do? Um, 
Well, I think it would be quite naive to say, no, we should like just work solely. I think like, you know, I think from that kind of perspective, it kind of links almost to Judith's point about a, a, an open charter. There's probably actually a common ground that we can seek a, around global meat consumption. And I, I do know that there are initiatives out there which look to unite insight and trends across a, a global environment and I think sort of finding the common ground finding things that you can learn on about consumers and how you might translate that is a great is a great point but then I think it's then also in the back backdrop of your mind you're probably thinking and how are we different or how do we stand out or how can we differentiate in a marketplace but also the mindful that obviously every other country is thinking that as well and I think it's kind of like finding common ground that we're all sort of looking at consumers trends and behaviors but actually that not not every country and region globally will act the same. We've done some great work internationally about understanding consumer behaviours in, in, in Asia. Uh, and we look, we, we've done country focus reports in, in, in North America and, and, and the EU. And I think sort of like when we start to unpick those behaviours, there are common things that you talk about, the taste, enjoyment. But there's, there's different things, for instance, in Asia, you know, the food safety element and how they consume meat is vastly different uh, around the link into bone in products versus, you know, the, the consumers in the UK about sort of like their sort of um, preference for either lean or healthier cuts or less bone, etc. And I think sort of like we need to understand those differentials, but also play to our strengths in a domestic, but also an international marketplace. Okay, I'm gonna come one last question. It's gonna to come to each of you in turn. Um, and if you could be relatively brief, uh, not aimed at you in particular, Michael, of course, but uh, if you could. We've got, um, we've got a fantastic uh, challenge in some ways this year. We've got COP26 towards the end of the year. We've got Henry Dimbleby's report coming out in the middle of next month. We've got the government white paper. We've got global UN summits on food systems, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Right? All of these potentially are going to be challenges in this arena. Now, personally, I also see every single one of those as a massive opportunity for us if we can get it right. So you've got some really good communicators on this call. Uh, you've also got some pretty atrocious ones, but you've got some really good communicators on the attending this evening. What's the one message you want them to land at each of those opportunities that we're going to have over the next few months to start to reposition the argument here? And I'm going to go, Michael, I'm going to go to you first. So keep it brief. Yeah, I, I agree that these are all uh, challenges, but over more, more so exciting times and opportunities. This is the next agricultural revolution. Um, and we've got to position food as the health industry. And, and, and that's where we are. And livestock have a critical role to, role to play on that, both the human and planetary. So that would be my pitch. The, agriculture is the health industry. The NHS is there when, when we need it and when we're falling. Uh, food should be keeping us upright. Steve. I think, I think it would be harness our strengths as an industry. We've got some really great assets and some great opportunities here. And I think uh, we've got great trust in farming and farmers that have come through and I think sort of carrying that through the supply chain from production to processing to retail and to conversion in the consumer's home I think it's something to be very proud of and I think for me it would be like thinking of uh, all these platforms I guess it's kind of my area of expertise is around consumers and my passion is around how what are those messages you're trying to get to consumers what are you trying to get through to them and I think if we can as an industry try and find those consistent markers then it's going to be a lot more effective and and they'll land more with consumers but as you say there's sort of some big events coming up and great opportunities but I think as well for consumers that it's there's got to be a uniqueness in in what we're saying and consistency and I think sort of like they've been exposed to meat consumption for a long time people know it's a cornerstone of their their meals and diets and I think to reassure but also make it the future that we have to give them those kind of proactive things that they can go and talk to their friends and family about and be proud of and judith we've um, we've got all these fantastic opportunities what's the one best truth you want everyone on this call to land over the next few months i i think it's the what i would describe as the connected business case so this has got to have multiple stakeholder lenses but it stacks up so whether you're talking about greenhouse gases and nutrients whether you're talking about land use whether you're talking about healthy years of life 
all of those things are part of a, a a complicated business case but you have to look at things holistically and anyone can look through a single lens and uh, and come to conclusions but we've got to be much more intelligent than that and put our single lens away and think more holistically and and um yeah the connected business case yeah Fantastic. Well, look, thank you, uh, Michael, Steve, Judith. It, it's been a real pleasure um, chairing this. I, I have chaired it atrociously because I think we've answered about 10% of all the questions that were put. Uh, so apologies for that. Uh, and apologies for those of you that didn't get uh, your question asked. I hope we touched on, on much of it. I think for me, um, listening to, to all three of you, um, there is actually huge, huge reasons to be optimistic uh, in this industry. I think it is a phenomenally exciting uh, opportunity going forward. I can't think of anywhere I would rather be producing livestock and being part of a meat industry than in this part of the world, actually potentially at this time with those opportunities that have been presented. But we've also got some big challenges. Um, and I hope that actually what our speakers have given everyone this evening is an enthusiasm actually to take that positive message forward, to start to find those best truths. That's gonna be my new phrase, Judith. So I'm gonna, I, I will bore you relentlessly on future meetings as I keep uh, bringing it back up. But look, it's been an absolutely fantastic event. Can I thank the Worshipful Company as well for putting this on? Uh, I know I was there when we talked about possibly putting on these events uh, and, and, and there may be some nervousness around it. This is a new venture, but actually the real mark of these events is how many people stay and virtually everyone has stayed for the entire call, even though we've gone on uh, beyond the time. So look, it's fantastic. There will be a recording of this uh, made available. So if you didn't manage to uh, photograph some of Judith or Michael or Steve's slides, you can grab them on the recording, I'm sure, uh, and play some of this back. But can I thank uh, each of the three of you? Um, we can't do the real clap as we normally would. We will uh, do the virtual one as ever. Thank you. And back to you, Master. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. And um, um, I, I know you've gone over time. And if you think that that is a, a reason that I'm not going to ask you back to talk at future Worship Company Butchers events, you're very much mistaken. Um, thank you all for attending this evening. I hope you've all found it um, uh, interesting and informative. As Stuart said, um, it is being recorded this evening, so the link will be shared to you all. And please feel free to share it with colleagues because there's a lot of information to take there. And as an industry, we've got a, a huge challenge of getting some of these some of this information and messages across. But it's very, very important that we do address this issue and ensure that consumers are not just hearing one side of the argument. Um, thank you, Stuart, for chairing this. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure. And um, thank you to our, our three speakers, Michael, Judith, Steve, for your for your insights. It's been a lovely evening and um, I hope this is the start of something that the WCB can get involved in with industry um, issues going forward. Thank you all.